All right, so welcome back to the official visit podcast of the Oregonian and Oregon Live. I'm Andrew Greif, Codux beat writer with Tyson Alger, and we're joined by a special guest covering the Ducks Bowl opponent, Carlos Mendez, covering uh, TCU for the Fort Worth Star Telegram. Thank you very much for joining us all the way from uh, from the Lone Star State. I'm glad to. I've got nothing to do this week but uh, talking about basketball, so let's get into football. <laughs> all right, well, I think that, I mean, the over-under for this game is 75. It's a pick em. Everybody knows kind of the expectation is that it's uh, going to be an offensive shootout. But from from what you know about TCU, um, do you think that this defense by TCU is really as bad as, as it was early in the season when they had so many injuries? Or do you think this could they may, may hold up a little better than people think? Yeah, I think they'll be better just because uh... – you know, they'll be healthier, and that's a big deal for this group. They just were down so many players midway through the year. But as they started to get two or three guys back, you know, there's still some guys they're not going to get back because they were done for the year. It's about five of those guys. But they did get three of those guys that were hurt back uh, into the rotation. And, uh, two of those guys were on the defensive line, which is a big deal. But as you saw them start to get healthier around the Kansas State game, around the Iowa State game, right around midseason, the defense really improved. But something interesting happened. The defense got better in the second half of games. You know, it still had problems starting out games. The first quarter was was real rough for these guys. And Patterson even pointed that out by the end of the season. He called it the worst first quarter defense in America that they've been playing with. But... Um, after halftime, after about the second half of the season started, uh, the defense played very well. They only gave up 59 points in the second half and overtime of the last six games, which, you know, when you break it down, is less than 10 points a half. Yeah. So that's acceptable, and that's what they're really counting on for January 2nd in the Alamo Dome is just a defense that plays like it's more experienced and plays like it's healthier, which... You know, if you can give Gary Patterson those two things, some experience and some help, he'll be much more confident than he was at any point this year. Hey, Carlos, this is Tyson Alger. Uh, what's uh, what's kind of more of the chatter about? Is it uh, TCU looking at chops at looking at Oregon's defense, a, a similarly um, kind of porous unit at times this year, or is it kind of? Oregon's offense and uh, Vernon Adams, which, you know, they obviously started very slowly, but over the last six weeks have been one of the best offenses in college football. You know, I imagine they're trying to look at ways to exploit the defense uh, for Oregon because that's that's been KCU's calling card this year is scoring points on offense and really getting that air raid to hum because the best part of their team is Trevon Boykin. And if he's operating at peak efficiency and if his receivers are catching the ball. You know, they're going to score points, and that's the way they've won games all year. From the offensive side for Oregon, this is an offensive style that over the last two years they've grown accustomed to practicing against. You know, they used to only practice against their own offense, which was uh, almost seems like an, a, an offense from a different time and place now. But now in the Big 12, four years into it and two years of facing their own their own big play offense, I think, has them with a little bit more confident footing as they get ready to face Oregon. You know, the wild card for them against Oregon is the way Vernon Adams is playing because in these last six games, he's played just like a guy that they've seen play on their own team. And they know firsthand what kind of what kind of problem that can be. Yeah, Vernon, Vernon is definitely not the kind of uh, runner in terms of comfort that that Trevon Boykin seems to be uh, obviously Boykin ninth in the Heisman voting with Connor Cook, another quarterback Oregon's faced this year. Um, what in, a couple of years ago, I think it's really interesting the parallels between Oregon and TCU. Oregon's got a bunch of quarterbacks on its roster behind Adams who really haven't developed all that well, um, and people kind of are already counting them out. Like you know, there's no way so and so four star recruit on Oregon's roster is going to be able to develop into a starting material by the next year. Um, Boykin, from everything I've read, was kind of in that boat where he was a really good athlete, but people really doubted whether he could become a quarterback a couple years ago. Um, How how did he go about that? How did he make that leap from 
really talented athlete to, you know, a great quarterback. Well, I think he had two advantages. One, aside from being a great athlete, is that he ran a similar offense in high school. And in high school, he was a just an electric runner, a guy who could cut seven times on one broken play and still score. So I think he, he, he brought with him a lot of that confidence from high school once he saw what this offense could ask of him. You know, it's a pass-first offense, and really it's designed for a pocket quarterback to just stand there and hit, and hit the open guy and read three or four times down the field. What Sonny Cumby and well, what Doug Meacham really added to it was a run aspect, and particularly a run aspect from the quarterback. So that's one thing that uh, Trevon Boykin brought to the table was his ability to make plays with his legs. So that helped him. But the other thing that helped him was Sonny Cumby who played this system for Mike Leach at Texas Tech and was not a running quarterback. Sonny Cumbie taught Trevon Boykin the footwork, the film work, the principles of the offense. And by all accounts, Trevon Boykin really picked it up. He's a smart guy. He understands football. And that really helped him to have Sonny Cumbie sit in a room with him for hours and just talk football and learn and practice and throw, and coming from a guy, Sonny Cumbie, who, you know, once put 70 points on Gary Patterson, that carried a lot of weight, not only with Patterson, but with Boykin, this was an authority, and the guy who had the numbers at Texas Tech to show you what this offense could do. So I think that's what turned it around for Trevon Boykin. One, he had done something like that before, and two, he had a terrific quarterback coach who could lead him right into this offense and show him exactly what to do and how to do it. So... Compared to past years, I would say uh, for most Oregon fans, the Alamo Bowl is kind of a, a, a step down, obviously, since they played in the national championship last year. But with how poorly this year started, where two months ago they were even wondering if they were going to reach a bowl game, I would say you know, the Alamo Bowl is a pretty good consolation for the Ducks. How does TCU view it? Because you know, three weeks ago, if they, you know, if they come out with a win against Oklahoma, they're probably playing in the playoff this week or in a couple weeks. Yeah, this was not uh, this was not part of the grand master plan for TCU this year. They certainly thought they had a team to reach the top four, and from where they started in the polls, number two in both the AP and coaches polls, you know, it's like starting in the front row in NASCAR race. You're you're good enough to get there if you can just you know keep your engine from breaking down or just avoid an accident. Problem is that they did have an engine breakdown. You know, Josh Dawson did get hurt. They did lose the game. Trevon Boykin did get hurt. To go along with the 23 other guys that got hurt, either missed the season, a game, or part of the game this year for them. But still to finish at number 11, to finish with 10 wins, and to end up at a good bowl, you know, in the big picture, that's fine. In the small picture, it's disappointing because that's not where they want to be at this time of the year. But... Getting to play Oregon, I think, for them is a big deal because this is one of those programs that they consider that Gary Passion last year told us is one of the new royalty in college football, and that's the kind of thing he's trying to follow, the, the kind of the kind of pattern he's trying to emulate, which is become one of these teams that people think of year after year in terms of those teams that compete for a national championship. Even if you don't do it every year, you need to be one of those teams that starts out the year in position to do it. But what I mean by that is top 10, top 8, top 6, somewhere that if things break right for you all year, you're in that top 4. You know, maybe you're going to lose a game, but you're still in that discussion. Sort of like Alabama is. They get a lot of benefit of the doubt just because they're there every year. So Oregon, he calls a resume game for them, for the program. They need to beat one of these teams that's there every year. And if you can get that out of this year, without with all the injuries, still with having lost two games, I think they'll call that a successful year. What, what I mean, you can kind of look at all the stats all day and look at kind of where Oregon's strong and TCU's weak and vice versa. Uh, but you've watched this team obviously up close all season, and and you kind of know its weak spots and its strengths. What what's one kind of Achilles heel that you think? Oregon might be able to to perhaps take advantage of of TCU. 
if I was Oregon, I would call it a pass interference play. <laughs> you can run that. You can have success with that against TCU. They had a problem with that all year. I haven't mean to do this. I haven't yet, but I need to count up the PIs that they totaled uh, for the season. It had to be 30. It might have been 25 or 30 because they had problems with that all year. They asked their guys to cover one-on-one so they can stop the run. And a lot of years, they're able to do it, but you know, in the Big 12, there are so many good receivers that it is just tough, and it was tough on them. So that's an area that, um, you know, clearly I think most people would agree was a weakness for TCU is just that single coverage on the corners. You know, plus they lost one of their starting cornerbacks in game three against SMU, so, you know, they didn't have him all year. And they're moving safeties to linebackers. They're borrowing safeties for cornerback. You know, there's been a lot of moving parts in the secondary. It's just been hard for them to get their feet on that. But they're not going to change. They continue to ask their guys to cover their man, play the ball, and make a play. And when it works, you're you're fine. You're stopping people. When it doesn't, you're giving up big chunks. And, you know, people exploited that all year. It started with SMU, and it continued all the way into the final game. You know, Baylor tried it, too, and they got a couple – PIs on their first two drives in the last game of the year. Now, the rain eventually was a great equalizer, but, you know, that's one thing that that I would watch for from both sides of this game is what can Oregon do to exploit that and can TCU fix it? The, uh, I guess conversely, other than Trevon Boykin, because Helfrich all week has been saying it's not just two guys, it's not just Josh Doxson. It's not just Trevon Boykin. They're deeper than that. I know he mentioned, you know, had a fair amount of praise for Aaron Green, the running back, who's got 1,100 yards. Um, it, besides those two usual suspects, Doxson and Boykin, who's the guy on offense who you think has to have a good game if they want to be successful? Well, a guy who's helped him a lot this year is a freshman. He's just a little five-nine scat back kid named Kevante Turpin, who is elusive as heck. He's like a mosquito. You just can't catch him. And he's a uh, returner. He returns punts and has been back there on kickoffs. But he's also a slot receiver, and he wound up being uh, the second leading receiver for the team, second leader in touchdown catches anyway. You know, he had four in one game against Texas. So this is a guy that's very dangerous. And if they can find a way to get them the ball, get him the ball in space, uh, I think they're going to try because, you know, we're going to be indoors, we're going to be on carpet. And for speed guys, elusive guys, cut guys like Kevonte Turpin, that's that's ideal. That's what that's what they want to play on. So I would look out for this guy, you know, beyond the names that you know. If I was if I was Oregon watching the game, uh, this is a guy they'll try to get the ball to a lot. It almost sounds a little similar to uh, Taj Griffin for the Ducks, who has been used increasingly yeah. more throughout the year. Uh, obviously, obviously, this bowl game is much closer to TCU than Oregon. How are you expecting uh, the fans travel? I expect it pretty well. You know, these, uh, these last few years for TCU have been they've created a real uptick in support. Uh, the stadium has been packed all year. That wasn't the case even last year when they were having their first real good year in the Big 12, but you know, this year from the start, the the fan attendance has been just outstanding. Some of that is the teams they draw. You know, the TCU and Texas game at 11 a.m. on a very bright, sunny day on a hot morning was packed at kickoff. You know, so that's a testament to how well the program is drawn right now. And this is a four-hour drive for a lot of people. And it's a place you want to go to anyway. It's a, it's a nice spot for New Year's. So I would expect a pretty good crowd anyway. And a lot of Oregon people know San Antonio as well from just two years ago. So I expect a big crowd. Ducks are going to get there into San Antonio, I want to say the day after Christmas. Uh, they want a lot of extra time to prepare for the Alamo Bowl, get down there in the elements. Uh, TCU looks like they're coming a little later, maybe like 28th or 29th. Um, is that just a factor you think of them? Just obviously being in the state, they don't really feel like they need to round up their guys necessarily and, and get them all in the same space? Or Yeah, it could be that. I think it might be more with uh, with Patterson trying to give these guys a mental break. He's talked about that, how you know, at the end of the year, he wanted them to get away from it a little bit, take their finals, you know, get their legs back, hit the weight room for a little bit. 
So it may be that they're delaying the start of their practices just a couple of days, and that's probably reflected in their uh, departure calendar. They do uh, they do leave on Monday the 28th, so that's what six days before the game, five days before the game. And I know the bubble requires you to stay five nights in town, so that's right on that schedule. So uh, I imagine that's what it's got to do with more than anything else. Okay, last question for you. I've heard that Gary Patterson is quite the musician. He fancies himself quite the musician. Uh, do you know what he plays, and have you ever heard him play? Yes, I do know <laughs> what he plays. He plays the guitar, and fortunately for me, from what I hear, I have not heard him play. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, no, he, I think he's pretty good on the guitar. Um, and he's played a few, uh, few shows around town. You know, every once in a while he'll pick up a guitar and just uh, start playing at an event, you know, just for some people. So, um, you know, that's one thing he likes to do a lot. And in fact, he compares it to to coaching football. He says, you know, that's my creative side, and on defense, you know, I like to express that creativity too. So, you know, he's got a uh, part musician in him, and he's part football coach. So, that's uh, that's his deal. That's his baby. Well, I know the from experience the Alamo Bowl kickoff luncheon is a pretty lively affair, so maybe they can get him up there with a with a guitar or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, a few days before a game, I don't know how lively. It is. <laughs> well, Carlos, thank you so much. Can let people know where they can read your stuff? What's your Twitter handle, and then uh, what's the Star Telegram website? Well, the Star Telegram is uh, just like it sounds. It's Star Hyphen Telegram dot com, and of course you can check out all our pages there and. I'm on Twitter at C A L E X Mendez. That's my first initial, middle name, last name, C Alex Mendez, at Twitter. So um, not hard to find me. Just do a quick search and I'll pop right up. All right. Thank you so much for popping on our podcast and uh, telling us about all things TCU. Really appreciate that. Hey, you bet.